Now more than ever, innovative technologies are fueling change and sparking new ways of thinking. Collaboration between corporations and startups is key to staying at the forefront of these trends. However, finding the right startups can be expensive, time-consuming, and ineffective. But Plug and Play is here to help. As a corporate partner, you will gain access to a whole ecosystem of innovation. Discover startups that meet your tech interests. Stay updated on the latest trends and network with industry peers. We will help you during every stage of your innovation journey, no matter where you are and where you want to go. Get in touch today. We are live, that's right. This is coming live to you, Plug and Play FinTech Batch 14 Expo. We are live. So wherever you are joining us from, from Chicago, Plano, Texas, Frankfurt, Paris, New York, New York, Japan, Singapore, or here from our headquarters in Sunnyvale. Welcome to our FinTech Batch 14 Expo, and we are very excited to have you here with us today. I'm Nadine Mühe, I'm the director of our FinTech Vertical, and I'm joined here by my wonderful colleague, Robbie Kuhn, who's leading our program. Hi, everyone. We are very excited to see you all here and have you join us for our FinTech Expo and really excited to show you some of the cool things we've got going on today. But for now, I'll hand it off to Nadine and you will see me a little bit later. Thank you so much, Robbie. Excellent. So we hopefully some of you have joined us this week for our enterprise InsureTech as well as health expo. So today, FinTech Expo is only one of the few major events that we are holding throughout the year. We do webinars, roundtables, trend workshops. So if you're interested in joining one of our events, check out our website, pluganplaytechcenter.com. That's the best way to stay up to date with the latest and greatest that's going on. So for today, FinTech Batch 14, an unbelievable program. And I want to give a big thank you and a big shout out to the entire team that helped organizing today's event. We do have a incredible group of startups with us today as well as speakers. So we'll dive right into it. And if you are joining us for the first time, Plug Play is all about connecting startups, entrepreneurs, corporations, as well as investors worldwide. That's what we do. We're very lucky to work with wonderful individuals that are working hard to transform their industries and rise up to today's challenges. So Plug and Play does this across several industries. And today here, our FinTech Expo is only one that we have going on this week as well as next week as part of our Winter Summit 2021. So a lot of our partners like to join us across several industries, the events to learn more about the innovations as well as disruptions that are happening to bring this back as inspirations to their own organizations. And what an incredible ecosystem Plug and Play has built. We have more than 40,000 startups across stages as well as geographies to work with you. Wherever this is to get inspiration, to validate your vision of the future, or to work on piloting proof of concepts and implementations to really drive your own business forward. And we have also grown. So here are some of the locations that we have launched last year. In fact, our team just came back from Chicago where we had a launch event with our fellow programs, retail as well as food and beverage. So the locations are growing. And what this means to you is that you get a local ecosystem of startups, of VCs, as well as mentors to really work on innovation, drive your initiatives forward throughout our programs, through our events, as well as our local teams on the ground. So if you are interested in opening up a new location, reach out to our team. If you are curious if there is already a location close by, there probably is, so get involved. And if you are a startup, these are great landing pads to enter new markets. And here's a little investment snapshot. So as many of you know, Plug and Play is one of the most active investors in the world. We have over 1,600 portfolio companies as part of our portfolio, including InsureTech, retail, mobility, IoT, travel, and of course, our beloved FinTech platform. 
So by region, we are doing about 70% of our investments domestically, but we are doing more and more investments these days in Europe, Latin America, Africa, as well as, of course, Asia. And this is one of my favorite slides. We do have several unicorns on the portfolio, 23 and counting. 2021 has been a record year for plug and play. Almost every month we had a new unicorn. And today we are incredibly excited to have Konstantin Richter, the CEO and founder of Plugdemon, a unicorn on our platform, a crypto unicorn with us. And as many of you know, our team is very excited about crypto. We do believe that it has tremendous opportunity for the future. And our team was at Money 2020 this year. And what we saw there was the perfect example of how dominant crypto and blockchain has become. So for everyone in the audience that is interested in crypto, blockchain, digital asset space, wherever you are a startup, you are a VC or your corporate partner, please use the poll. We would love to get you involved, signal your interest or use the chat. Our, my colleague Maximilian Youngreis will put his email in the chat as well. So get in touch. We would love to get you involved. And this year, our team has been focusing very much on events. Um, we are very excited to invite you to our, one of our upcoming events. It's an innovation workshop that we are holding on November 23rd. So if you are interested in joining this event, please use the QR code to register. Uh, if you are working in corporate innovation, this is an event that you definitely don't want to miss. We will have two of our startups that have been working very successfully with multiple corporations on POCs, pilots and implementations. And these startups will share with you their journey, their learning, as well as the pitfalls and how you can avoid them. So very excited to have this event and hopefully we can see you there. And one of the things that we have done over the course of the last two to three years is becoming incredibly digital. So Playbook is our foray into, the, into venture capital. We do have over 40,000 startups on that platform all first party data, all enterprise focused solutions. And most importantly, at Plank Play, we are a matchmaker. We are connecting the best entrepreneurs worldwide with the best corporations around the world to really drive innovation. And over the course of the last 12 months, we counted over 7,000 deal flows. And what this equates to is more than 230,000 startup corporate introductions. So it is really mind blowing what we are doing here. And with that, I want to give a big shout out to our corporate partners. It's thanks to you that we built this great ecosystem that our start, that you bring the opportunities and the challenges that you are seeing in the space to us, work with the startups, really attract new startups and drive the entire ecosystem forward. So we wouldn't be where we are today without you. So thank you for trusting us. Thank you for being a corporate partner. And we hope that you enjoy working with us as much as we do. So a lot of activity is happening right now across crypto, ESG, rack tech, personal finance operations, payments, as well as lending. Every single category within FinTech has been under tremendous transformation throughout the pandemic and behind. And it's thanks to you that we identified these categories and are really here today celebrating our expo event with you. Robbie and the entire team have been working very hard over the course of the last three months with the 17 startups that you can see here to help them to prepare their pitch, to work on their strategy, to uh, host startup workshops, and most importantly, to meet our corporate partners. So, Today, you will see the progress that they have made over the course of the last three months. And to kick off today's event, I am very excited to announce the fireside chat that we have with George Demuni, who is leading Plug and Play's Ventures team, as well as Konstantin Richter, who is the CEO of Blockdaemon, an incredible blockchain infrastructure platform that raised 150 million with a valuation of 1.2 billion. With that, I will hand it over to you, George. Thank you so much, Nadine. Well, for those of you who don't know me, my name is George Demoni. I am one of the partners here at Plug and Play Ventures. 
I've been lucky enough to spend my last eight years here at Plug and Play investing in some amazing companies. And I am very, very pleased to announce our keynote speaker, which is one of those companies. His name is Konstantin Richter, the CEO and founder of Block Damon. Konstantin is a serial entrepreneur, investor, and advisor. He started his career at Deutsche Telekom with a stint at Nokia before he became an entrepreneur, successfully building out SaaS marketplace platforms like AudioTube, Lookbooks, and WireDrive with his last successful exit in 2017. He has been an, he's been active in the blockchain ecosystem as an advisor and contributor since 2015 with entities like Gem, Poet, Madhive, before creating Block Damon towards the end of 2017 to bring institutional grade infrastructure to blockchain protocols, crypto native, and traditional financial institutions. Block Damon was announced our newest unicorn with SoftBank's recent investment at a $1.2 billion valuation. And they participated in batch six of our, re of our FinTech program, and now is coming full circle and keynoting this talk. Thank you so much, Constantine. The floor is yours, my friend, and then we'll, we'll hop on for a fireside chat afterwards. Yeah, thank you so much. Very exciting and uh, very happy to be here, of course. Um, let me um, go into my um, screen share mode here. Uh, I want to make sure you guys have uh, good visibility. Oops, actually, what am I doing over here? One second. Let me go hit present. Um, so, uh, yeah, very happy to be here. Um, as uh, mentioned, uh, we started Block Demon. Uh, the first institutional check that came in was actually from Plug and Play uh, back in uh, pretty much four years ago. Um, and so um, I'm very happy to say that uh, for us, uh, this was uh, a match made in heaven, uh, mostly because when I started Block Demon, I um, was struggling um, quite a few different things and uh, we really wanted a place where we could ideate and build POCs around node deployment and I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, but uh, uh, plug and play was our home at that time. Um, and for me, as a company builder, it was the first sort of, you know, really attending the pitch and um, securing a commitment uh, was sort of my first uh, uh, sort of air quote success where I knew I think this might have legs. So um, yeah, and so we're uh, Block Damon. I'm going to give you a quick overview um, who we are uh, today. Um, we're um, you know 110 uh, people. We're a remote first crypto engineering company. People sit around the world. Um, we um, are the largest node operator in the blockchain space. Really, what that means: nodes are the individual data centers, software, uh, data, or virtual machines. Um, that contain a, a copy of a ledger and the software that dictates how the ledger gets updated. It's the quintessential component of a blockchain and um, they uh, govern and secure the chain and any institution uh, of node, crypto native or new who wants their customers to uh, uh, allow their customers to hold or send tokens anywhere needs to run a node and we um, and they, uh, you know, a good chunk of them outsource that uh, to us, mostly because these networks are all uh, like Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera, et cetera. They're all open source uh, developer driven ecosystems. And it's just not easy to stay current and ensure that these nodes operate 24 seven with a 99.999% uptime and failover strategy, et cetera, et cetera. It requires um, a lot of um, knowledge and awareness and experience to do that well. Uh, we've uh, deployed over 23 thousand full nodes, um, uh, you know, the, I'd say we're probably at a 20% of global, you know, high performance nodes in the world are operated by block daemon across uh, 10 cloud uh, provider and data center providers. Uh, we have over 70 different data centers um, that are running these nodes, uh, ensuring that nodes aren't centralized is important. And so even though uh, some folks uh, say that, hey, block daemon runs a lot of infrastructure, what would happen? If uh, Block Demon goes down, the way we run the nodes is that we run them across so many different data centers and territories that we're actually uh, a net positive for any of these networks because there is always, always um, risk with, uh, for example, overexposure on Amazon East, for example. We did a study once that I think over 70% of ETH nodes alone were based in, in that particular region on one cloud. And so having a company like Block Demon being able to deploy, redeploy nodes across all these different infrastructures at a click of a button is actually very important in order to ensure institutional adoption of these systems. And so um, the uh, uh, and what that looks like for us, we're, we're over 100 uh, institutional customers at this point in time. 
Uh, some of them are public, some of them aren't. Um, uh, I'll, I'll try and reference a few. Uh, the business in 2021, uh, uh, so far we've generated around $50 million in value, which is really uh, MRR, um, which is month monthly recurring revenue in which we're uh, currently uh, nearing a sort of 3 million MRR. Um, which uh, and then the rest is yield earnings on tokens. Uh, we have around 10 billions of tokens that are staked on nodes we operate, which is a way to secure these networks. And uh, uh, and so there's a nice, interesting compounding effect uh, in in uh, our respective revenue numbers. And the business has been cash flow positive for the last 12 months and generated uh, quite nice returns, which is why it's been easy for us to uh, raise funds and uh, establish valuations that allow us to increase um, uh, our uh, balance sheet in order to, one, uh, play and think through a regulatory complexities, global diversification, as well as an acquisition pipeline in order to really you know, lock in the market leadership we currently have around institutional infrastructure in this space. Um, and so uh, you know, we have a, a couple of quick, just briefly uh, for us, the uh, investors here that we've added since and uh, you know, plug and play actually, you know, obviously deserves a prominent position in here and we'll update it, uh, I promise. Um, the, the, but those are all the big ones that, uh, you know, came after. And so uh, you can see a couple of them. Um, uh, we um, have also JP Morgan, Tiger uh, is not on here yet. Um, we're constantly adding new investors, SoftBank, Goldman Sachs, we're the first uh, uh, token centric entity invested in by any of the large banks in the world. Um, and then, uh, you know, our customers range uh, pretty widely from funds to, you know, some more household names like Checkout.com or Citibank. Um, and there's a whole variety of different entities as well as custodians that we power core infrastructure with um, in the space. Um, let me see. Um, and so what we do, and I don't want to spend too much time, but we, we started really as a SaaS platform company. And so for us building backends, dashboards, and infrastructure that allows for nodes to be monitored um, and monetized is important. So the way we kind of think of ourselves is a mixture of like a Stripe slash data dog for crypto. Um, but, you know, we are a software company. And so, you know, we have a product live a marketplace. This is where people experience our products. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it's actually not too far from how we started. Um, when uh, um, me and at the time, Arun, the engineer who worked with me, started at Plug and Play, uh, we um, had a pretty similar UI for Bitcoin and Ethereum. Now we do it at a much different scale. We've learned a lot since, but um, we were always very product UX driven as a company and that has helped us uh, grow quickly. Um, we support all the major protocols. Uh, we Our infrastructure um, is currently the most uh, in-depth one in the space. Uh, the reason why I mention it is for us, the, the way we think about ourselves going forward is really as a, um, a crypto cloud. Uh, and what that means is a single integration touch point for institutions in order to uh, work and support um, anything they need to do with the protocol, which can be pushing transactions, pulling data, earning stake or yield. And so uh, offering a, um, an infrastructure solution that allows you to connect to any of the major crypto blockchains, submit transactions, pull data, earn yield without actually having to operate you know, 40 different APIs um, or uh, hard infrastructure yourself. Um, and so um, the, there's a couple of uh, important bits in this world and in crypto in general, there's always an element of risk. And so uh, the other component that was very important and one of the things that we've learned really well in plug and play because um, plug and play is very enterprise focused is that we need to eliminate the institutional risk factors in order to get institutions to engage in something this risky right and so um, we actually have insurance and cover any potential losses associated with our nodes um, and there's complex mechanisms in place uh, in order to manage that uh, but that's been a really important factor and is a point of differentiation uh, to us. Um, we're also ISO uh, compliant. Uh, we have chief compliant officers. We adhere to, uh, we, we're mirroring um, being regulated as a money transmitter, um, which we aren't. Uh, regulators uh, don't want to regulate us. We would like them to. Uh, and so we've assumed a position of, uh, um, of someone who should have a money transmitter license, which we believe is applicable for a company offering staking notes. 
and have implemented those um, things uh, successfully. Uh, the biggest and most challenging one is publishing financial audited accounts, which we also do. And so we've done a lot of growing up since we started in order to be a recognized um, integration partner for financial institutions that they can trust and rely on. Um, so, um, yeah, and so I actually, you know, I think I might um, um, uh, stop here uh, because I do want to make sure we have time um, to talk and uh, I don't want to go too deep into the technological setup of uh, staking and so um, and, and nodes in general. So, uh, yeah, feel free to reach out to me after. Um, there's lots more information also to be found on our website if you have questions, case studies, everything there is um, uh, available online. So uh, thank you very much. Amazing, Constantine. Well, first off, I have to congratulate you for the amazing success that you've had over the last three and four years, uh, you know, working from, you know, where you started with, I think you were pitching the Heroku of blockchains when we first invested right. in the company, and where you are today, which is just incredible. Congratulations to you and the entire Block Damon team, really. Yeah, thank you. And Heroku, that's true. And, and, and uh, you know, I was re-watching on YouTube um, our graduation video, you know, when you have the big event and uh, it's a sort of two, three minute pitch. And um, I've gotten a lot wrong also. At the time, I thought that everything is too open sourced and crazy for institutions. So I thought there's going to be a lot of permission chains that are going to get spun up. But the key premise I said is that I believe that by 2020, every major institution will run some form of blockchain nodes and we weren't too far off there. Right. Um, so structuring the business around nodes uh, obviously was the right thing. And uh, I do want to call out Heroku uh, and part of our plug and play succession after plug and play was we actually got the Heroku founders to invest right. and, uh, and they're also on the cap table and they came in sort of a month after you guys did. And so, uh, yeah, that was, uh, you know, also very helpful. That's incredible. That's incredible. Well, a lot of our banking partners are on the line today and in person. And, you know, you work with a lot of banks and financial institutions in general. And just love to know, you know, a lot of crypto companies get stuck in this POC land with banks and FIs in general and have trouble making it to the next step of commercialization or full contract deployment. And what do you think are the best practices for a crypto company, maybe drawing on your experiences working with banks and FIs in general, how they can get in, who to sell into, what are the best practices selling your crypto infrastructure company into a bank or an FI? Yeah, uh, it's, you know, it's a great question. And it's, it's one we've uh, uh, struggled with also because it's been very hard in 2017, 2018, specifically with, at the time, the crypto winter and the the sort of perception of the industry that oh this is just too crazy and not industrial grade and what I would say is the way we've approached it is we think of institutions as anyone who serves large scales uh, of customers in a legitimate way and uh, so we pivoted our business to focus on institutions that actually have enormous scale and customers uh, the coinbase like entities right and so I'm contractually not allowed to name check a lot of them mostly because of security and confidentiality reasons, but uh, the largest customer cohort um, comes out of the top 10 global uh, crypto exchanges for us and the existing custodians. And uh, it's important, uh, you know, and so for us, those are the litmus tests for an initial institutional adoption, right? right? Those are the guys who have high volume. Those are the guys who have to actually process complex stuff. They need 24 seven customer support. They hammer the system really hard. and. I think a lot of folks at the time kind of somehow figured those aren't institutions, which is obviously, um, you know, I think a, a mistake. But now, obviously, Coinbase is a what nearly hundred billion dollar entity and publicly listed, and so a lot of those have very institution-like setups. You know, they're fully regulated uh, entities, and so we started selling aggressively into those um, in the absence of making progress with more in traditional finance entities. And then, uh, and so what was great about that is we had the best and highest use case. Those are folks who have the most demand on the platform. And then over time, slowly, the more traditional institutions started to get a little more serious. And so now when they come to us and say, hey, we want to actually work on a POC, um, it, it's not that we have to build a lot, you know, it's like, okay, hey, here's the infrastructure, you can do all these eight things. We know what you should be doing, because we're doing it for companies who do 10 times your volume. 
Um, and so we can guide the conversation a lot more um, stringently and yep. give them product that actually is industrial grade because we've had to iterate and provide industrial grade products to our crypto native customers. And so the maturity of the crypto native segment has driven a lot of the current adoption we see in the market. Um, I would say that there's also different categories of entities. And so for us, the companies that are um, in terms of volume, the largest and, and are going to be the largest in 2022 are the sort of digital money uh, banks, you know, the PayPal's, the Robinhood's, the Revolut's, the, the entities that offer stock and crypto things online. And so uh, th that's a very fast growing segment. Uh, they already offer, if you go to PayPal or Robinhood, you, you know, you can buy Bitcoin and Ethereum and all those solutions require nodes, for example. And uh, and then the you know the JP Morgans and Bank of America are sort of you know they're following behind, um, but you want to integrate starting to iterate with them early and get them into live production and satisfy their risk and security concerns and then grow with them. Amazing, yeah. And the market's getting there, right? Just as you said, I think we we had a little slowdown during the crypto winter, but the market has definitely picked up, and obviously the price of of crypto in general across the board speaks for itself, right? And yeah. uh, Constantine, you mentioned staking a lot in your talk and mm -hmm. just for those on the line, um, what is staking? If you can uh, you know, answer it in, in very simple terms. Yeah, sure. Uh, so the way uh, any of these currencies, you know, the currencies are really like currencies, they're a monetary system. And uh, like um, every other monetary system, they have tools in order to manage uh, uh, supply and demand in order to ensure that there isn't insane inflation. And so uh, what staking is, is one way to secure a chain uh, technically, i.e. I, it provides the governance and the ownership of voting on the chain. And uh, there's proof of work, which is familiar for folks who are into Bitcoin. That's the current way of how Bitcoin is governed, which ultimately means that you need to prove computational prowess in order to be allowed um, to submit a block. Um, and uh, and then you get rewarded and people have built really complex mechanisms in order to secure that reward. In proof of stake, what you have to do is um, aggregate funds onto a node. So it's actually like a bond issuance. Think of it as um, the, the networks that rely on proof of stake want investors to lock up their tokens in a wallet, in a crypto wallet, and connect that wallet to a node. That's really what staking is. And the node then monitors that the funds in the wallet haven't moved. And if, if that hasn't happened, so it's a little bit like signing a five-year, whatever, municipal bond, and you get 5%, and, and that's that, you know? And so obviously the funds need to be locked up. And that's kind of what proof of stake is. It, it sort of shows that you have that stake and it's committed to a node. And if you don't move uh, the stake appropriately, there's different ways how timing is measured based on protocols. You earn a particular amount of interest for not moving the stake. And um, the more volatile these networks early are, the higher the amount of interest is they pay mm -hmm. because they want to control, uh, they want to make sure people don't dump the token, for example. And so uh, the reason why this is getting very popular is these yields in early stages of these networks tend to be fairly large. Um, and currently, these yields far outpace returns on traditional financial um, uh, uh, ecosystems. And now these currencies are so large and have actually economies behind them in terms of market makers, derivative products. Um, and so there's a lot of liquidity in the market and uh, thus uh, a lot more uh, also now normal institutional investors are seeking the sort of near double digit returns on, on, on those uh, interest payouts. So it could be a hedge against inflation as well, right? Right. And so, yeah, and, and I mean, uh, for sure, and specifically because they obviously also cut loose from existing uh, monetary policies, like when the US, uh, you know, prints, um, you know, doubles its money supply over uh, 18 months, then obviously that has, uh, like in any other currency, that would have a lot of effect on the price of a token. And uh, thus, you know, I'm sure the feds will one way or another, um, try to deal with it. And, um, and so, that means, uh, you know, in order to avoid uh, the government-centric monetary policies, something like Bitcoin is a good hedge. Um, there's uh, a certain school in crypto that says the, the crypto revolution is actually the separation of state and money. Mm -hmm. And that's why a lot of people feel very, very strongly about it. It's to them as important as the separation of uh, church and state was. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and a huge topic on, on just like the crypto market in general and Bitcoin in general is the intersection of sustainability and cryptocurrency or Bitcoin. And proof of stake has a lot to do with impacting the environment and whatnot. But 
any like what how does proof in, proof of stake impact the environment and can you talk about sustainability and the intersection of sustainability and bitcoin at all yeah for sure i mean first off i think it's obviously one of the topics that uh, get misrepresented quite a bit um in in the uh, news media you know because it's it's a little tricky to compare very different means of production and say this wastes this much energy and this this much uh, i think um the the crypto world believes in innovation and market economics the cheapest energy is uh, um, a sustainable one which is uh, sun wind ocean um, and so uh, anything that brings your cost of production to zero yields the most return in mining and so i would assume that uh, the largest innovators in sustainable energy creation um, are probably bitcoin mining companies who are looking for you know the best returns possible and so um, it's very popular to try and buy huge solar and 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 you know there's the complexity of having a lot of heat and a lot of sun when you run data centers but all those things are uh, very very popular and i would say that the um uh, nothing drives innovation like uh, uh uh you know greed and intellect um <laughs> uh, does you know ultimately and so i believe that it's ultimately uh, the innovation generated around making bitcoin more efficient will be a key contributor to how we solve uh, the climate crisis um the other big issue here is when you think about uh, you know, Bitcoin specifically is one of the big and complex things I think that we in the cryptocurrency world uh, believe is that the financial system and the current system of governance for nations is very corrupted, which means it doesn't really matter that much which party is in power. They just represent different lobbyists and interest groups um, that are vying for, you know, the most influence. And uh, and so solving complex issues like climate change might have to happen outside of those frameworks. Mm -hmm. And the only way we can attribute value outside of these frameworks is by cross-national currencies like Bitcoin. And so my my assumption would be that something like Bitcoin will allow us to battle with uh, 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 misintentioned nation states in order to enforce commercial behavior that aids the common good. And so it's a complex conversation and I don't want to sound like a crazy person, but um, uh, I do believe that there is a lot of innovation driving that proof of stake has a different mechanism. It's uh, uh, the opposite. Uh, and so proof of work requires a lot of work and that work costs energy. Thus, people say, hey, this is bad for the environment. Um, and proof of stake doesn't require work. It just requires might. <laughs> it requires uh, the ability to have a lot of tokens, which is other issues, but environmental ones aren't any of those concerns. Incredible. I mean, what an amazing vision as well for, for that. Um, Constantine, so I got a note that we need to wrap uh, up quickly. So I have a lot of rapid fire questions for you. Sure. Okay. Thoughts on NFTs? Yeah, absolutely. Interesting. Uh, uh, hard to do this really fast. What I think <laughs> is interesting. So what you're currently seeing uh, is obviously experimentation phase. Uh, I would, uh, uh, I think people underestimate the young generation's willingness to invest in digital assets uh, massively. Right. Um, it's it's uh, a, a real huge mistake, and I think NFTs will be really interesting when you uh, assign digital ownership to a share, for example, or uh, 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 you know a title uh, to a house. So lots of great innovation and will be super relevant. Amazing, amazing. And then uh, a, a pretty relevant topic today: Dogecoin, Shiba Inu, dog coins in general. Uh, sure. <laughs> just like them. What do you think? Yeah, uh, you know, popular question. Um, I think, um, uh, first off, I want to say that uh, I think most folks, it goes to NFTs. These are meme stocks. Uh, lots of kids like playing with them. Uh, I don't think anyone is fooled into thinking that this is a serious uh, uh, bond-like investment. I think people assume that people are more stupid than they are. Um, these are playful uh, activities. I think Dogecoin um, is a bit of a tragic example. The founder of Dogecoin is a great person with a lot of great ideas, and he's very unhappy uh, that something that clearly was a satire and joke suddenly became an economic uh, entity. That said, um, you know, it's uh, I'm very happy for younger generations and enthusiasts to learn how cryptocurrencies work. So sure. as long as nobody puts their life savings into it, but uh, likes the uh, adventure, um, you know, I think it's a it's a good thing. And Robinhood uh, bulk of their revenue in the first six months of the year was in relation to Dogecoin transactions. So seems to be um, a reality we need to deal with. Yes, yes. And then um, kind of a final story that when uh, Constantin and I were talking in in March of 2020. Uh, he's really good at predicting futures. Uh, this is not financial advice, but he told me 
Georgia, I think you should invest in some more Bitcoin. I was lucky enough to have Bitcoin since 2014. But after that call, uh, I bought more. Um, and the price was like 9 or 10K at the time. So, Constantine, I want to publicly thank you for that advice because I did yeah. make a killing on that. It did go on a tear towards the end of the year, which, which, which is what you said. But um, price predictions for December 31st of 2021 of this year. Well, so first off, obviously, no financial advice. Uh, and, and I think the way I would put it is more... Um, it's worth looking into the economical policies of these tokens like you would in a country. And a lot of these tokens like Bitcoin have actually automatic software systems that are transparent and visible to look at by everyone um, that dictates the inflation rate. And so think of it as uh, a white paper the feds have written that will tell you what the interest rates in the next 24 months will look like and then base your investment decisions on that. And so what I was referencing was uh, the halving. Um, and uh, that was happening in Bitcoin. And so, you know, basic economic principle applies that when you throttle the supply of something and demand uh, uh, play stays the same, then prices go up. Um, there's uh, another uh, software where that will automatically occur and that relates to Ethereum and ETH 2.0. And so if these things occur, um, then uh, you will see that uh, uh, the opposite will happen in Ethereum where um, suddenly, um, it's very valuable for you to uh, not sell your ETH and earn very high interest when ETH 2.0 occurs. And then uh, and that will lock in a lot of tokens and it also will drive more demand for other people chasing that high yield, which requires you to purchase ETH in a market where there's less liquidity. So, you know, if you so if you assume that this will occur and that crypto doesn't die and all that type of stuff, then economically it leads you to one conclusion. So applying the same macroeconomic principles to the leading cryptocurrencies is smart. And because they're systemic and predictable, because you can read about uh, when these inflationary um, uh, journeys occur. So I would say do read up on it and yeah, you'll see and apply simple economics. Yep. I think we could all read between the lines there. So <laughs> Constantine, you are amazing. Thank you again so, so much. And congratulations again on all your progress. Uh, if you do want to get in contact with Constantine, please shoot any of us a ping here at Plug and Play, and we will be happy to connect you to Block Damon for potential uh, partnerships. So with that, Constantine, again, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And we'll pass it to Robbie to introduce batch 14 of Plug and Play FinTech. Thanks again. Thanks so much. Bye. All right, thank you so much, George and Constantine, for that incredibly informative discussion. And thank you all for being here today, whether you're joining us online or here in person, we're really thrilled to have you. My name is Robbie Kunanda, and I'm a program manager here at Plug and Play. And I'm really excited to be the moderator for today's event. But first, I wanna just go through some really quick housekeeping. Uh, the rest of the team is always here for you. So if you're joining us via Zoom and you have any question at any point in time during this event, please feel free to just reach out in the chat and I'm absolutely sure someone would be happy to assist you. Also, please do not forget to answer the polls that you will see on your screen after each presentation. So if you wanna meet with any of the people that you hear from today, um, make sure you uh, say that you would like to and we will be sure to follow up after this event to make sure that we can facilitate all of these connections. But finally, here's the moment you've all been waiting for. We're going to jump right into the startup presentations. Presenting first is a blockchain, e-commerce, and micro-task company. If you're a basketball fan, you might actually recognize their logo from the jersey of the Portland Trailblazers. Presenting Storm X. Hi, everyone. My name is Simon Yu, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Storm X. And we're revolutionizing how people earn and shop through blockchain and cryptocurrency. As you probably know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. And because of COVID, e-commerce has skyrocketed compared to the previous years. With a rise in e-commerce over the last decade, we've seen cashback services such as Honey becoming popular, as users can earn passive income on their shopping transactions. Honey was recently acquired by PayPal for $4 billion, legitimizing this industry. Let me tell you how we're able to grow faster than any of the unicorns, such as Honey and Microten. First, we're currently across 150 countries as our patented blockchain technology allows us to send payments across the globe for mere cents. With traditional fiat partners like Honey, it's not possible to send a $10 user reward halfway across the world, otherwise it would cost more than the actual transaction. Second, we're able to offer up to two and a half times higher cashback using our own cryptocurrency by rewarding our most loyal users without jumping into an endless price war with competitors. 
Because of our unique product offerings of higher cashback and having a global presence, we've grown significantly since our mobile launch towards the end of February last year. One of the hardest challenges of crypto products is how difficult it is to use. So one of our main focuses within the company is user experience. All a user has to do is install our app, start shopping from any of our featured stores, and the crypto rewards will be sent to their wallet. In the short time our shop product has been live, we've already added over 1,000 stores globally, including some of the top known brands like eBay, Nike, and more. When you look at how we compare to some of our competitors, it's a no-brainer. Not only do we have a global presence, but we offer significantly higher cashback. We developed our own patented blockchain technology that allows us to scale and send user transactions for minimal cost globally. We were granted the patent in 2018. We've also fixed one of crypto's other problem, which is why do you need a token? The StormX tokens allow users to upgrade their reward levels so they can sign up for higher cashback from any of our stores. The more tokens you purchase or earn, the higher cashback you can get, and you can sell your membership at any time. Our rewards program is also one of the reasons why users choose us versus our competitors, as the more they use our product, the higher rewards users can earn back on each purchase. You're probably thinking this idea sucks. Users don't want some random cryptocurrency token. This model won't work. But in just 18 months, we've been able to attract over 100,000 users, integrating their wallet and depositing over $25 million of their own balance to our smart contracts. Even though we offer Bitcoin and other popular cryptocurrencies as withdrawal methods, over 95% of our weekly payments is requested and made in StormX tokens. Not only are our users feeling confident in our product, but our investors as well. Over the last four months, we were able to raise over $15 million to help expand the crypto debit card, adding 15,000 stores to our roster. Furthermore, we recently became the first crypto company to be a Jersey Pat Perch Pat partner with the NBA. Up until recently, we were relying on purely organic traffic to grow, and we will start ramping up aggressive marketing over the next several years. Thanks for listening in, and brace yourselves. The storm is coming. All right. If you're interested in connecting with StormX, uh, mark on, yes on the poll that is on your screen now. Salesforce for programmable money. PayPal for the decentralized world. Public Mint is a working USD native blockchain platform that allows anyone to easily create USD accounts and transfer funds instantly. Presenting next is Public Mint. Hi everyone, my name is Paul Rodriguez, I'm CEO at Public Mint, and we're very happy to be here at Plug and Play. We also want to thank you for selecting us for this round. I represent a team of successful tech entrepreneurs, uh, software engineers, and also business people from the banking and payments industry. What we've built over the last two and a half years is a global money system, which means that anyone can access their own funds in a totally regulated manner. So we're not just another payments company, we're not building on top of uh, regular building blocks. We're not using an approach like PayPal or Venmo. We're actually using the benefits of blockchain technology, but in a totally regulated manner, using only fiat as the currency available. So what we did over this last uh, uh, two and a half years was working with banks and trust companies. They hold the funds for us. And we simply create this fintech layer on top of it with synthetic versions of the dollar that are that now become fully fungible to be a transferred between parties. So our architecture implies that we have full compatibility with payment infrastructures. Anyone that opens a, a public mint wallet can deposit funds using wire ACH or credit cards. But at, on the other side of the equation, you have this ability to convert funds into information, which means that now funds become uh, faster, just like an email. And anyone can program uh, the funds directly, like individuals or businesses can develop their own smart contracts or solutions on top of our open APIs and be able to create this ecosystem of smart services. On one side, you have regulators happy because the funds are being held in custody by regulated entities, by banks and trust companies. And on the other side, you have individuals happy because now money becomes really fast, just like an email. So. With our solution that is currently up and running, you can open an account in two minutes. And if you do KYC, then you'll be able to deposit funds into your account using wire ACH or credit card. Now, uh, with that in mind, you now are already available, able to send monies globally instantly to anyone. But we have this solution up and running for roughly around eight months. We have partners already running on our platform. They are doing microtransactions. They are you, you doing instant payouts to their providers. But at the end of the day, we're missing a killer app. And that's why we focused our attention over the last months into what we call the EARN program that's going to be launched in the beginning of October. And that means that 
not only you have the ability to send funds instantly, but also while your funds are sitting on your wallet, you can earn interest uh, earnings on top of that. Again, reaping the benefits of innovation that is happening on blockchain, but in a totally regulated manner. So we're working also with payment gateways in order to be able to provide for other users to deposit their funds directly into public mint using their own domestic schemes. It's all about creating partnerships and additional rails for money to flow in and out from public mint. Uh, and because we are planning to extend not only dollar, dollars are already available on chain. We want to also to have euros and pounds that will enable the ability to have instant real time Forex for all our users. Debit cards also are also planned so that anyone can use the funds on the wallet in a regular POS. And loans also very interesting coming up because it will provide instant access to loans to all our customers. And last but not least, the open network, the ability to have a third party integration. This means that we are totally full and fully compatible with Ethereum. All the innovation that is happening on Ethereum can simply be deployed on our blockchain and all the developers now have access to program fiat directly, not a crypto asset. At the end of the day, this is kind of like a Salesforce approach, but instead of doing Salesforce for data, we're doing Salesforce for, for programmable money. So this is a screenshot of, of the wallet that's going to be launched in October. Uh, the ability to manage your funds, and also the ability to earn passive income on, on your funds. At the end of the day, we're all about the community. We have 50,000 people on our Telegram group. They act as our ambassadors and early adopters, and they're also already developing their own solutions on, on our sandbox. Thank you for your time, and I hope to have interesting conversations right after this presentation. All right, we would love to connect you to Public Mint, but you need to let us know that you're interested. So please be sure to mark yes on the poll that should be on your screen now, and we'll be happy to make that connection. All right, up next, Digital Asset Bank as a Platform. BankX has developed the infrastructure needed to build platform utilizing digital assets tech. Let's hear about their capability to work with USD, loyalty points, tokenized real estate, and crypto. Let's hear from BankX. Hi, I'm Ming Zhang. I am a co-founder at MeFi, a borderless self-custody neobank. You can think of it as a bank without bank accounts. Here's our team. My co-founder Igor and I have been friends since Stanford Business School for about 12 years. We've both been fintech entrepreneurs. Our CTO, Dennis, brings 15 years of technical experience and the core team has collaborated with us very well. We're targeting a massive underserved market of about half of the world population. I'm from China and Igor is from Russia, and we both understand firsthand what global middle class is struggling with. First, our currencies are not stable. Two, our inflations are high. And three, we lack the same access to the global financial system, the same attractive financial products that the top 10% has access to. So what we're proposing is a hybrid solution that brings the best of both worlds from both traditional finance and DeFi. We're a DeFi first company, start with a self-custody MeFi wallet. And from that point, the user can either open a US bank account or earn 6 to 8% savings enabled by DeFi. And we have three layers of compliance here. First is the two-factor authentication, then when they convert the local currency into our solution, there's the local crypto KYC. And lastly, the strongest U.S. bank KYC and AML enabled by third-party compliance and service providers. In the future, we plan to launch other DeFi products, such as our proprietary real estate coin. We've seen over 200 applications with demand from 65 countries and the demographic distribution is concentrated from 26 to 50 years old. Our roadmap near term is to launch the MeFi portal for Latin America, the three core features, the MeFi wallet, US bank accounts, and 68% savings, as well as the money service business license for California. Down the road, we'd like to add the insurance on the MeFi wallet that makes us on par with FDIC bank accounts. Long-term goal is to become a bank for people of the world and serve over 100 million users and be one of the largest neobanks in the world. Our go-to-market strategy for Live America includes both partnering with local exchanges such as Newbank, Bitso, and other brokers, 
as well as building chat communities, uh, which we've been successful at acquiring at less than 50 cents per member. We we'll also offer the freemium business model and incentives to attract and retain customers. We're raising a $3 million seed round uh, to reach these milestones. We'll launch the alpha in second quarter of next year. We are looking to get 100,000 community members and convert 10% of that to users. Uh, we already have a million committed from angels. We're seeking both lead and co-investors by mid-November. Um, about 12 funds and a few other strategic investors are interested. And in addition to funding, we're also looking for partners who can offer insurance on the MiFi wallet or act as banks of record for potentially over 100 million global clients. Thank you for your interest and please let us know any questions. All right, if you're interested in meeting with them, right now is your chance to give us that information. Let us know by answering yes in the poll and we'll be happy to follow up. But up next is a company that you actually might recognize if you attended Plug and Play's recent webinar on redefining the customer experience. Dreams offers an engagement banking platform that uses science to boost customer engagement and financial well-being. So let's hear it from Dreams. Hi everyone, my name is Hedvig Algren and I'm an account executive at Dreams, an engagement banking platform fueled by science. It is no surprise that consumer nowadays are struggling with their finances. 75% of all millennials mention money as their top stress source. On the other side, PFMs have been on the rise for quite some time, but have yet not been successful with low adaptation rates and poor results. And this is because they neglect how the human mind works and how emotion is fueling our decision making. Dreams offers the first engagement banking platform that solves exactly this. We've been collaborating with major universities during the last eight years in order to integrate insights from psychology, neuroscience and behavioral economics for maximum effectiveness in our solution. So at the core is a scientific method that we develop with universities such as Harvard, University of Toronto, to mention a few. Our scientific method surrounds around two key principles. So first and foremost, Dreams makes it easy to save, invest, and pay off debt. Instead of overwhelming the customer about what they should do, we lower the barrier for engagement by making it convenient as the core principle is leveraging emotions. This is by science, the most effective way to motivate any action and change. So for example, we all know that exercise is great for us, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we do it as often as we think or know we should. And with all this said, we have designed a unique solution that is highly effective both in boosting customer engagement as well as financial well-being. And it all starts with a dream. So instead of talking about go-based savings or what you should do with your money, we rather ask them, what are you dreaming about? And by defining that, how much they need and when in time, it's instantly emotional. This makes it harder also to neglect or abandon. After that, they pick what we call save hacks. And save hacks are small automated programs that helps the customer find money for their dreams. So for example, it could be an automated weekly savings taken from your home account, or it can also challenge a behavior. For example, what if you skip that takeout coffee you buy each morning and rather save $20 to that weekend you really wanna to go to, or maybe to pay back your debt faster? Knowing your customer like this opens up the possibilities to collect valuable data that enables insights driven business for real. And looking at our metrics, we're proud to say that users having dreams have 50 more engagement per month with their digital solution. Further, they save on average $2,000 more per year and two out of three says that they feel less stressed about money only after two months of using it. 79% of all users are millennials. And 27% of all dreams are long-term and 3% debt-related. 
which means great up and cross-sell opportunities. Originally, we're a B2C company where we've been live for the last five years in our home market, Sweden and Norway, where we're currently serving 500,000 users. And by popular demand, we have recently launched our B2B solution, which we offer to banks and financial institutions as a white label solution that can easily be embedded in digital experiences. We're trusted by large global banks and are also acknowledged as thought leaders by Forrester within financial well-being. With all this said, we're looking forward to turn PFMs into something that actually works and not only that but also bring great success to consumers so thank you so much for listening uh, if you're interested in talking more with us please drop us an email or you can also click yes in the little pop-up that will come soon thank you so much just like they said if you'd like to connect with them hit yes in the pop-up that should be on your screen now Our next company may have its roots in NYC, but they have people working across North America, Europe, and Asia. Array of embedded credit and identity management solutions for financial institutions and fintechs to provide to their customers via digital banking channels. Let's hear from Array. Hi, I'm Jacob Bauer, Head of Strategic Partnerships at Array. Some of you may recognize me as I used to be on the plug and play fintech team. Array is a Series A fintech, helping banks go live with consumer credit and identity protection tools embedded inside their digital banking experiences. We have over 100 customers today, profitable after a little over a year and a half in business, and we are excited to partner with you all in the plug and play ecosystem. Array's credit and identity solutions help your customers better understand their credit standing and how to improve that score, thus supporting the financial wellness and helping you create a more lendable customer base. Everything we do is embedded inside your digital banking experiences. And so when it comes to credit and identity, we wanna help you increase customer engagement and bring customers back into your solution. And with that engagement comes data, unlocking credit profiles of your customers proactively and their intent. And with the Raise Offers Engine, we can help you sell more products and drive revenue. There's three buckets of the solution, credit tools, identity protection, and offers engine. Within credit tools, there's over 20 embedded components to really help your customers understand things like what is my score what are the factors in fact affecting my score how can i improve that score and how can i leverage my score when it comes to products in my institution within identity protection there's over five modules revolving around identity monitoring identity protection services identity restoration services if something were to happen as well as an identity insurance product between these two buckets everything's fully a la carte so you can go to market with a custom solution that makes sense for your customers and your products. The offers engine is actually sitting on top of both the credit and identity tools, leveraging the credit information and intent data to offer your products the right products at the right time. There are two institutions who have gone out there and built this themselves, Capital One and Chase, but they've really shown customers what to expect when it comes to consumer credit insights. This was no easy task partnering with the bureaus to do so, cost them millions, takes teams of over 50 people, and took years to go to market. With Array, we can help you do this cost effectively and much more easily. There's the, also the affiliate marketer side of the business. So Credit Sesame, Credit Karma, and many others out there who have created a business based on giving credit information to your customers and then turning that information around and selling them competitive products to your institution. So again, in comes Array, partnering with institutions large and small to keep your customers inside of your mobile banking solutions and so helping you sell them your products. Everything we do is fully embedded and white labeled, allowing you to have a custom look and feel, as well as a custom uh, suite of products that you can go to market with quickly. And we're compliance ready. We are PCI compliant, well on our way to SOC 2 type two, and we have a token tokenization system allowing you to uh, stay out of compliance scope when it comes to PII. As an example, this is what the Wells Fargo Credit Insights tool looks like today. It's one score from Experian, it's not dynamic, it doesn't give me any other information other than what my score is today. With Array, here's what it can look like. A dynamic tool with a number of modules, as well as a featured card at the bottom, 
utilizing the offers engine data, understanding that this is the right product for me. And so with Array, let's help you take your consumer credits and identity protection tools to the next level. Thanks, and we look forward to working with you. All right, if you liked Array's presentation and you wanna learn a little bit more, let us know by marking yes in the poll box that should be on your screen now, and we'd be happy to facilitate. For our next presentation, are you who you say you are? That's the question our next company is actually looking to answer. Simple ID is a global identity network based on blockchain technology and self-sovereign identity looking to give people control of their digital identities. Presenting Simple ID. Hi, I'm Peter Kirby. I'm the CEO of Simple ID. We're a blockchain identity platform. We do strong customer authentication and we do it for the credit card space. And this is my why. This is my daughter, Eleanor. She was born this summer. Eleanor gets to inherit one of two different worlds. One, where identity is controlled by Google, Facebook, and Apple. Or two, where we build a neutral network, like a DNS for identity. We're big believers that it gets to be the latter. So the opportunity here is huge. Credit card fraud had a banner year in 2020. And the reason is, is because we stopped using plastic and we started typing our credit card numbers into our computers. Card not present fraud is now 90% of the fraud. And more importantly, false declines are now up close to 3% of all transactions or about $440 billion. Also, in Europe, there's this big push for strong customer authentication. Two out of three, something you know, like a password, something you have, like an ID, or something you are, like a biometric, on every payment transaction. So everybody's scratching their head saying, how do we do this without sending lots of private information around? So what we do is really straightforward. We call it real-time identity proofing. And this is what it looks like. Do a quick payment transaction. It can be anywhere like Amazon. And then based on your card number, you'll get a pop-up in your phone. Click it, use your own biometrics in your phone to approve the transaction, and you're off and running. It's simpler than signing a piece of paper. The way it works is it integrates with the 3D secure platform. That allows us to have a direct interaction between the issuing banks, the people who issue the cards, and the customers. And it just works right out of the box. It fits with 98% of credit card transactions. Under the hood, we have what we call a simple identity score. On a scale of one to 100, how sure we are that Peter is Peter. Think of it as on a one, we're pretty sure you're human. A 50, we'd let you buy a diamond. And maybe with a 100, we could even let you do voting online. The way that we position ourselves is we're a super low friction experience for the customer, but we're also not sending any private identifiable information. We don't send it, we don't store it. This is neutral, like the DNS. Our target market is we're going after the issuing departments of the credit card companies. So there's a huge stack of payments, but specifically they're the ones that have the direct relationship with the customer. And our vision's really clear. Every time they issue a new card, that card can be added by the user into the Simple ID network. And every time that card number gets used, you use your own phone to verify that that's you. We've had some pretty significant traction. We're working on a data partnership with Experian, and that's what's going to let us do all the deep identity proofing that we need to tie you to your phone. Also, we brought in advisors at MasterCard, UBS, and Valley Bank, um, really significant uh, innovators who are helping us understand the ecosystem and how we play in it. We're um, most of the way to participating in the MasterCard program for global um, acceleration, and we raised our pre-seed round through ATX Venture Partners. Our ask is really straightforward. We're looking for early pilot customers um, that are coming from the issuing side of the credit card industry. Um, we're looking for people who are willing to try out a new product and give us the kind of early feedback that will help us refine that to production levels. My email below is peterkirby at simpleid.us. Thank you so much. If you would like to be connected to Peter and the rest of the Simple ID team, please let us know now. Econins provides digital simulation and advice services for 
personal finances, generating more confident consumers and high conversation rates for the banks. The solution includes interactive life, interactive life events and scenario simulations. Our next company, Econins. Hello everyone, I'm Petrina Amaker from Econons, a fintech from Gothenburg, Sweden. Econons creates technologies that help individuals understand the impact of their financial decisions to lead happier, healthier, more sustainable lives. Econons is live with several Nordic banks and we're backed by multiple investors with strong interest in sustainable social finance, including Almi Invest, a VC investment arm of the Swedish government. Today's consumers have a wealth of opportunities that are one click away, whether it's mortgaging a new home or financing a necessary expense. But we've all heard the scary stories about the lack of financial literacy out there, and this can have a major impact on an individual's financial, physical, and mental well-being. And there are implications for the entire economy. Because so many consumers lack the financial capability to understand their choices, this means bad financial decisions are also a click away. Consumers start their financial decision making at home, but ultimately most of them will turn to their financial institution for help. And this is where Equinons comes in. Equinons helps customers where they are financially, and we meet them early on in their decision making process. Our digital advice and simulation tools create more confident customers and higher conversion rates for the bank, taking them from curiosity to confidence. And the results speak for themselves. On average, we see that users spend over seven minutes in our simulation tools. We see almost a three times increased conversion rate into the bank's products three times more interested consumers when banks use Econons in their marketing, as well as reduced pressures on customer support, all because users have interacted with the Econon solution. We achieve these metrics with Forteller and Figure. Forteller is a financial life event simulator. It provides a clear picture of how a user's financial decisions impacts their entire financial situation both now and in the future, giving users just enough information to help them confidently pursue their goals. And new for 2022 is Forteller Green. Forteller Green helps users see how making green choices may impact lifestyle and goals, whether financial or environmental. By making a few simple selections, a user can see how their home stacks up against similar homes from a carbon footprint standpoint. They can also see how something like installing solar panels may reduce their home's impact, as well as to see financing options available from the bank. This gives consumers relevant information and about their financial and environmental impact. Figure. Figure is a financial guidance robot for bank user journeys such as mortgages, sustainable homes, and more. And the real strength of Figure is that it provides automated, personalized advice that helps users explore options and alternatives that they may not have known existed. Beyond all this, Econon's tech is incredibly simple for the bank. In fact, our customers have implemented our solution in under three days. It's purely white labeled, so it's a differentiator for the bank's brand, and there are no messy onboarding or compliance issues because no information ever leaves the user's browser. In addition to our technology, Equinons offers banks soft values with hard returns. We're focused on results in our innovation, and we offer a roadmap that has been validated based on market research and our team's expertise. Thank you all for listening today, and we look forward to seeing you in the future at Econons. We would love to connect you to the Econons team. Just let us know in the poll that should be on your screen right now. Did you know that 45 million Americans are financial caregivers for aging loved ones? Careful is building the first and only financial services platform for a new generation of caregivers and their $190 billion of annual spend. 
allowing adults to manage, coordinate, contribute, and monitor an aging loved one's daily money and finances. So let's hear it from the Careful team. Hey, I'm Todd Rovac, founder at Careful. Excited to talk about how Careful is unlocking cross-generational wealth transfer for banks. First, banks are losing what we call the wealth transfer battle. There is 24 trillion in generational wealth transfer already underway, and yet nine out of 10 people will not use their parents' bank or advisor. That's a problem. Missing is what we call relationship continuity. There's no tool uh, or platform for how banks can retain and grow the assets and accounts that they have, or how they bring in the adult children who may not yet bank with them. So said another way, rather than lose one customer, how do they turn one customer into two or three? The bridge is what we call financial caregiving. That's the financial caregiving need state. There are 45 million uh, financial caregivers in the US. Um, Careful is the first platform uh, to take care of these people who we believe are deeply underserved. So what is financial caregiving? It is uh, a set of activities, uh, coordination, contribution, oversight. Uh, it's a ton of things. These people are monitoring other people's accounts for fraud, ensuring bills are paid on time, calling the banks to resolve issues, collecting funds from others and commingling the money. It's a hundred daily tasks and, and time and emotion. And somewhere in there, the assets are pulled or consolidated or drained uh, among other things. Underneath these activities, 50 billion in fraud. It's the fraud that we hear about um, from the outside, but also the fraud we don't from within the trusted circle. Um, that happens a lot. Um, uh, to say nothing of the actual mistakes that human beings just make as they age and financial decisions declining as cognitive ability declines. Uh, most importantly, we're talking about a financial relationship and a need state that stretches for as long as 20 years. So a long time and period to um, bridge that gap and bridge generations and add value. Here's careful today, here's how we do it. Um, first is smart monitoring. It's a body of caregiving monitoring with a big machine learning uh, AI engine that looks for things that banks and advisors don't or can't look for today with any efficiency. Um, things like duplicate payments, missed payments, um, increases in credit and in, in, um, paying windows, strange cash usage, but also financial caregiving specific things like charitable contributions that wind up being recurring, political donations. Um, we look for low uh, pharmacy spending drops, uh, means you may not be taking care of yourself. Um, um, we look for um, behavior change. It's very personalized. $5,000 for your mom is not $5,000 for my mom. And so um, uh, we know what to look for. And uh, it, it's an entire body of and rule book um, for older adults. Um, so that's the first thing that we do. It also includes credit monitoring, identity theft protection, uh, and things like that. Um, so smart monitoring is our bread and butter. Um, it allows for the second thing, which is impactful conversations. We facilitate communication between these financial caregiving adults, their aging loved one, or reverse um, advisors, um, anyone else. So everyone sees the same thing, no more subjective arguments. Here you start a conversation, export an alert if you need to, um, or to send a reminder, get things resolved. Uh, third, we teach and educate about what to do next, when to get power of attorney, how to do your parents' taxes, how to respot dementia um, in the wallet, things like that. Um, and finally, advisor views. Um, so uh, they allow this allows advisors or wealth managers to see everyone in their practice on it in one place. When they include um, family members in their circle, we're able to see not just share a wallet, but share a family, who are the other people involved that we might be able to bring into our practice. Um, and from this, we can create more opportunities. Here's how we work with banks and advisors today. Uh, this is a real one, Citizens in Northern. Um, like a lot of banks, we stand up a bank branded microsite for them. Um, they offer it as a high value benefit for customers. Uh, that includes credit monitoring, but also the core careful service I described. It's our product uh, and content. They look for cross-sell opportunities. Um, there are people building checking products and trust products powered by careful. Um, the idea is they retain assets while attracting family. And this is a live one. Um, on the advisor side, advisors are offering it to their older clients um, and uh, to, as a way for them to maintain financial independence. Everybody wants to stay in control. Um, offering them this service as a way to do that. 
But again, it's a relationship continuity engine. Retain the assets while attracting and bringing in the new family. Um, turn one client into three. And they do that with something uh, we're happy to show later that we, we call the Careful Pro dashboard. Um, talked a lot about um, the, the content that we create. I'm very happy to, to show this as well. Um, we rate pretty highly for, for in search because people are looking for the kinds of, of answers um, that we provide, how to do your parents' taxes, uh, what it's like to be a financial caregiver, how to stop fraud and scams, um, et cetera. That's our Real Simple Smart Money Award. Um, we were the highest rated uh, of, the, uh, of the awards they gave out in 2021 for new um, um, products and services, really proud of that. But in general, if wealth transfer and account growth is on your whiteboard somewhere, um, think of careful uh, and financial caregiving playing across generations as the key to unlocking it. If you'd like to chat or join our ecosystem of partners, we'd be really excited to discuss these things further. Thank you. If you'd like to be connected with the careful team, please check the box and let us know right now. And now we're actually halfway through our startup presentations. So I would like to welcome a special guest and keynote speaker, uh, EY Partner Parthenon or EY Parthenon partner Aaron Byrne. Aaron is an established business leader with extensive, extensive experience working with CEOs and executive teams on their most strategic mandates. He leads the EY Parthenon financial services strategy, transaction strategy, and turnaround value creation team globally and in the Americas. And he's very excited to talk with you today about utilizing partnerships to bolster corporate innovation. So over to you, Aaron. Thank you, Robbie. I'm truly honored to have the opportunity to speak to this esteemed group and share my thoughts. What a tremendous and exciting time to be a part of the dynamic changes happening in financial services and across all forms of financial technology. The pace of change across all areas of financial services sector is rapid, be it banking, asset management, wealth management, capital markets, payments, or insurance. It doesn't take much to see this change happening all around you. Who needs a wallet anymore? Just pay with your smartphone of choice. Need some items but don't wanna pay right now? Why not use Klarna, Affirm, Afterpay, or Sezzle? Somehow they seem to have all your data ready anyway. Just bought a car? Why see an insurance agent when many car companies such as Tesla, Porsche, Mercedes, and Toyota will provide you a policy at the time of purchase? Need a mortgage? Why go to a branch? The largest US mortgage issuer is fast like a rocket, and you can get home insurance from a hippo. Need to deposit a check? Just snap an image. Or even fundamentally, why hold fiat currency? When you can just keep it accessible and easily transferable by a circle through USD stablecoin. Didn't get into Bitcoin back in 2017 when it was $1,000 per token. Don't have more than $62,000 for a token now. But need to invest with less than $100,000? Well, there's Betterment and Wealthfront to help you. No subsector is immune to the disruption that has accelerated over the past several years. Over the course of this discussion, I'm going to briefly cover the impact of a few global mega trends, the implication of trends on financial services and financial technology, the new growth environment in financial services, the foundational elements that have altered the financial services mindset, and the perspective that it takes to harness innovation. This is a lot to cover, so I'm going to do my best to bring it all together. When we talk about global mega trends among a myriad of changes, what specifically are we talking about? And how is it a catalyst for continuous disruption? A few key forces that have set us on a new path across multiple sectors include human augmentation, the rise of Gen Z, and climate change. Human augmentation or enhancement of human abilities through technology is the movement of speed of data at over a hundred times, allowing for continuously connected devices, the migration of computation capabilities to your fingertips, an enhancement of precision sensors to allow for immediate, responsive, immersive environments. 
The way we provide financial services and assess impacts is evolving. Next, the rise of Gen Z and generational shifts. Gen Z will represent approximately 24% of the human population in the next decade. The population of the world leading economies are growing its elderly, while developing market societies have grown a number of their youths. 96% of Gen Z own smartphones, has seven plus social media accounts, and spends three hours a day on social media. In addition, Gen Z is generally more progressive on social issues than preceding generations. How Gen Z chooses to use financial services has broad sector implications. Climate change. The impacts and costs of climate change are becoming increasingly more evident and more covered. Coverage of notable climate change events has increased 100 to 300% depending on the areas of focus. Additionally, climate impacts amplify the many dislocations of our era, such as populism, pandemics, automation, immigration, income inequality, and demographic change. These ecological and societal trends are changing financial services products and service in a myriad of ways. All of these mega trends are driving broader shifts such as decarbonization, behavioral economics, accelerated technology competition, synthetic media, and the future of thinking through AI and predictive analytics, just to name a few. What does this mean for financial services? And what are the implications on financial services and fin financial technology? Specifically in financial services and financial technology, megatrends have created fundamental changes in what is perceived as value, what constitutes an asset and how are assets transferable? Where and how is growth manifesting globally, domestically, and within and across the financial services sector? The types of risks that we need to manage and what customers expect. How do we see this manifesting in new growth environment and financial services? Some estimates have financial technologies doubling in size over the course of the next decade. Growth rate expectations over the next five to seven years are significant. Cryptocurrency is estimated at 60.6%. Blockchain, 42.6%. FinTech lending, 32.3%. Robo-advisory, 31.8%. And SureTech, 24.4%. Just to name a few. Ultimately, we have entered a new innovation S-curve in financial services. The expectation of what and how value is delivered across stakeholders, not just shareholders, has shifted. Incumbent financial services institutions have started to take note. Jamie Dimon noted, the financial technologies are an enormous competitive threat that is here to stay, and a letter shareholders before the pandemic. Since that time, the pace of change has accelerated. Incumbent financial services are, all re, all, are also recognizing that the outpaced change created by financial technologies cannot be replicated through building capabilities in-house. Why do all these colliding trends matter? What fundamentally has moved? What has been the catalyst for innovation in financial services? There's a seemingly basic series of ideas. Maybe the customer and their experience are more important than the product. Taken further, customers should have the ability to seamlessly obtain financial services whenever and wherever they are in the course of their everyday life. And even a step beyond that, everyone in societies across the world should have equitable access to financial stability, security, and wellness. What do you do about it? What perspective does it take to harness innovation? This brings us to a fundamental question. If your institution is standing on the outside or promises to be the most significant change in financial services for several decades, what do you do about it? 
Do you test the waters to better understand the innovation? Many institutions have set up corporate venture capital arms to invest, harness growth, and learn. Do you shift your business model and rethink ways you can access innovation through ecosystems? Several institutions have adopted ecosystem strategies. They consider new ways of envisioning their future, their overall value chain, and network to create new possibilities and ways of thinking. Do you find partnerships and potentially other inorganic means of accessing innovation of others? Financial services and fintech partnerships have become increasingly prevalent, and institutions and innovators are looking to gain benefit from each other's talent and strengths. Or do you just do all of the above? The answer is yes. Being stagnant is not an option. The ground is moving under our feet. It's time to harvest, harness an innovator's mindset and consider a future of new possibilities. Looking at the challenges faced by those who provide services to with empathy. Identifying the fundamental problem statements that can better be addressed to increase value and experience. Being willing to take risks that stretch an existing institution beyond its comfort zone. This also means changing culture and debunking accepted norms. Building networks outside the four walls of an institution, recognizing that there is growth opportunity embedded in harnessing the different strengths of others. And continually observing and reflecting on one other concept, change. To create growth, opportunity, and adaptability. Every day, fintech startup companies and founders are waking up and imagining how our lives and everyone's lives could be better through more seamless financial services experiences and enhanced means of transacting, transferring, storing, and protecting value. How exciting would it be to harness that passion and purpose in everything you're doing within your institutions? We have limitless possibilities before us as we work through what will be a new era of financial services. And to borrow a quote, there are no limits. There are only plateaus, and you must not stay there. You must go beyond them. Thank you very much for your time. And now I'll hand it back to Robbie. Thank you so much, Aaron, for taking the time to be a part of our expo today. I'm sure everyone here really appreciates it and really thrilled to uh, have you included. Presenting next is a financial service company creating a new API-based network enabling access to consumer data. Akoya transforms the way consumers share their data by providing them with increased security, transparency, and control over their information. Let's hear a bit more from the Akoya team. Hi, my name is Ted Anastasi, and I'm responsible for the sales and marketing team here at Akoya. We live in a digital, hyper-connected world today that unfortunately has only been accelerated by the pandemic. If you think of Experian Boost, Venmo, Rocket Mortgage, consumers are demanding their information be made available to third parties for real-time decisioning. Our mission is to transform the way consumers provide access to their data with increased security, privacy, and control over their information. The COIA was originated within the Fidelity Investment Center enterprise several years ago with the goal of moving Fidelity away from screen scraping and getting logging credentials out of the marketplace. Our peers out there recognize the value of what we're doing and decided to join us on this journey via a deal brokered by the Clearinghouse in February 2020, where we took investments from 11 North American banks logoed on this screen. We now each have an equal seat at the board and an equal equity stake in Akoya. Again, the level set. Screen scraping has been around for the last two decades, but today cybersecurity is paramount. Logging credentials out there in the marketplace is unacceptable and things need to change and they need to change now. There is a solution out there. Several financial institutions began the journey of building out an API gateway or data access network for themselves. And just like Fidelity and some of our owners quickly learned that the time to negotiate 
data access legal agreements, the time to put the third party through an information security audit and vendor due diligence effort, and then to create and maintain connectivity was taken 18 to 24 months each. No way we're gonna move from screen scraping anytime soon on the current environment. So here comes Akoya. A financial institution can make one integration with Akoya, one legal agreement and put Akoya through one security review, and then have access to an ever-growing ecosystem of data recipients, the likes of fintechs, aggregators, and even financial institutions who not only want to be a data provider on the network, but also a data recipient. I want to spend a minute just on one thing we are not. Akoya is not and never will be a data aggregator because we do not store any data. We only store anonymized client IDs and account IDs and access tokens needed to facilitate data flow. We'll never have login credentials because we never screen scrape. We'll never have yet another data lake of your customer list out there and then potentially not be using the data in ways that it wasn't intended to be used. So data minimization for a specific use case in hand is core to the Akoya data access network. Again, to summarize the benefits to integrate with Akoya, get logging credentials out of the marketplace by eliminating screen scraping. Allow Akoya to do your compliance oversight on third parties. Give your customers increased transparency and control over where their data goes and what level of granularity and how often. And then finally, streamline those integrations with these third parties, again, fintechs, aggregators, for example. We work with several financial institutions that have stood up as a data provider on the Akoya Data Access Network to define what it would cost them to build it themselves for connectivity to just five data recipients or one integration with Akoya that gets them access to those five data recipients. And the cost savings was significant. 80% on a one-time integration and an ongoing basis, also an 80% savings there for the annual maintenance. Akoya has had a lot of success out there in the marketplace recently. Please visit us at akoya.com or Twitter or LinkedIn to take a look at our recent press releases. And our ask of you is real simple. We're here. Please reach out. Love to talk to you. Thank you. All right. You should know, know, know the drill by now. If you're interested in connecting with them, please mark yes on the poll. ASA is a scalable platform that removes all barriers to entry, allowing unlimited partnerships between fintechs and financial institutions. They align incentives between the financial institutions and fintechs, allowing them to share data both ways and to market and promote each other's products and services. Presenting ASA. Asa Whitney was the visionary proponent of the transcontinental railroad. In like fashion, Asa is building a new set of rails that will interconnect banks with all technology and empower individuals to take control of their finances. Banks are spending billions of dollars trying to partner with fintech, but the time, the risk, and the cost is far too great a burden. ASA solves the regulatory and compliance risk of partnering with fintechs, allowing you to almost instantly offer whatever technology that you want. ASA does a full integration with your backend core systems. We anonymize and tokenize all of the regulated data, allowing your customers to use fintechs without sharing usernames, passwords, or account numbers. They don't even have to share their name or email address, making this the most private way to use fintech that has ever been invented. Rather than spending years and hundreds of thousands of dollars to partner with one or two fintechs, ASA is a one to three month integration and gives you access to any of the technology that you'd like. You send new fintech solutions to ASA and we'll get them quickly integrated for free. And whenever we add a new solution, every bank on the network will gain access to that new technology. It's a many to many double sided marketplace. For customers, they download the ASA Vault, and then we have a KYC process through the core processor. They'll select their bank or credit union, and when they register with their bank, it will notify uh, the bank that the user has registered and the bank can see all of the fintechs that that customer is using. They'll also have bank-wide data on usage for each fintech. It'll then take the customer in to see their checking, savings, credit cards, and verify their accounts, and then into the ASA App Store, 
where they can see all of the available apps and preview them on the Apple App Store as well. To connect, they simply select which accounts they want to sync up with each individual fintech. And then they create a dynamic URL that allows them to download the fintech and ad automatically prime and register the app and permission data access instantly. They can also turn that data off just as easily with one click, leaving no PII data behind. Rather than fintechs having to almost become banks by going through SOC 2 and PCI and worry about AML and KYC and Patriot Act, etc., ASA allows fintechs to connect to our network and never receive access to the core and to never receive access to regulated data. And so instead of offering their own checking accounts or credit cards and loans, they're simply building upon the solutions that you have already in place. So they'll help you grow and succeed. ASA is an extremely valuable retention tool because your customers will be able to get all of the technology they need without leaving your ecosystem. You'll also have the technology that you need to attract the younger demographic and to win new customers and grow. ASA aligns incentives between fintechs, between banks, and between core processors. Every party wins. We're the first platform out there that doesn't compete with any of these entities. And that's why our traction is so strong. We've had interest from three of the big five. We have core processors, fintechs, and banks all waiting to get started. And we've built a team with experience in core processors, fintechs, and banking, including our CTO. He recently completed a project building Jack Henry's payment platform. He built First Data's payment gateway. He did global payments for Walmart, McDonald's. Our team is ready to execute, and we are building the future rails for banking, and we would like to invite you to help us on this journey. Thank you. Our next company's finance as a service platform enables financial services partners to rapidly configure and host next generation financial service products in their entirety. Sertua's services and data integrations can be used by fintechs and non-financial service companies alike. So let's hear a little bit more about what they have to say. Hi, my name is Luke Peely, and I'm here to tell you about Sertua's embedded finance platform. There's a market inefficiency crying out to be solved. Digital platforms and service providers who are A, struggling to differentiate their product or service, B, looking to increase customer retention, and C, wanting to monetize their data asset, are seeking to distribute financial services as an option to do so. Simultaneously, financial services companies who want to grow revenues and are seeking to do so by A, accessing new digital markets, B, innovating on legacy product shape, and C, accessing new data for use in their decision-making processes. Wouldn't it be great if both could be connected by a platform? Well, that's us. The Secure platform connects digital product and service providers with financial services to enable the next generation of embedded finance propositions. We are the link between financial service product manufacturers and digital channels of distribution, working with partners on both sides of the market to design and develop the financial services propositions of the future. For manufacturers, we facilitate the end-to-end -end product lifecycle from design through configuration, testing and deployment to generating those all important insights. For distribution partners, typically these are digital platforms and marketplaces, we make available next generation financial services products to embed as part of an existing core proposition. We thought this was a pretty big inefficiency, but even we didn't realize the potential value in new market opportunities resulting from embedded finance. According to Bain Capital, the opportunity in credit and insurance alone, which is really our heartland, totals $2.6 trillion as digital platforms move to incorporate financial services. We provide the infrastructure to enable this paradigm shift. So what does a platform like this look like and why? And you know, why doesn't it exist today? Well, we've been in R&D slash stealth mode for almost five years working with industry partners to build the administration platform of the future, one which is data-driven, has machine learning at its core, and supports the end-to-end -end life cycle closed loop. We have four proprietary modules covering product hosting, decision-making, data science, and treasury management, all sharing a common data warehouse 
and overlaid with a performance enterprise-grade API to power distribution. Whether our partners are looking to run experiments or overhaul a proprietary product journey, we have a distribution option to suit. And who exactly is using our, this platform to date? Well, we have a number of UK-based partners spanning both credit and insurance, and we're working to onboard multiple prospects now across Europe. Some examples include Tenants Caledonian Breweries in Scotland, who are offering a digital volume linked short form advance of discount product to provide working capital to 7,000 pubs and restaurants, uh, which are restarting operations following the pandemic. We also offer digital bank account connectivity via an open banking and advice platform to 250,000 financial advisors. These financial advisors serve roughly 8 million end clients in the UK with a roadmap to introduce both credit and insurance products. So what makes it, what slash who make a good partner? Well, we are best at supporting scale financial services institutions who are struggling to access digital markets for their insurance or credit products. Or on the other side, we're looking to support scale digital service providers who are looking to design and embed those financial services products as part of their core proposition. If this is you, then please get in touch. We'd love to hear you from you. Um, thank you very much for listening and uh, looking forward to questions. Next up is Workera. Workera is an enterprise precision upskilling company that enables organizations to identify, measure, interpret, and develop the right data and AI skills to realize their fullest potential today and in the future. Let's hear from Workera. Hello, everyone. I'm James Lee, the co-founder and chief operating officer of Workera.ai a precision upskilling platform for enterprises. Let's start with the problem that Workera is solving. Today, investment in developing data and AI skills is at an all-time high. The global corporate e-learning market is $200 billion and will grow to over $300 billion over the next four years. And yet anxiety amongst company leaders about their data and AI capabilities is also at record levels. 79% of CEOs are concerned about their organization's lack of skills. And more than two thirds of HR leaders say that building critical skills and competencies is their number one priority. But why are CEOs and HR leaders so concerned in this day and age when there is a veritable ocean of high quality content available? Why is it that an astonishing 80% of employees still lack the skills they need to deliver on current and future projects? It's because content alone is not enough and upskilling is still broken today. Companies cannot answer these fundamental questions, which include, what skills do my people have today? What skills does my organization need? How effective are my people today? How do I upskill and reskill my people? And how do I demonstrate ROI and increase capability? Workera helps enterprises answer these questions. Our AI-driven solution provides precise skills development at scale. We start with an innovative assessment that automatically understands each employee's skills as well as their gaps, benchmarked against their industry. Based on these assessments, we deliver personalized learning at an individual level across your entire team or company. The skills data from this learning feeds into your organization's learning systems so that leaders can demonstrate ROI. Workera is starting with data and AI, skills that are fundamentally changing the world and profoundly impacting every industry. Our team is uniquely suited to solve this problem. We're experts in the space with academic leaders, AI luminaries, and industry veterans that have delivered high-scale solutions to global Fortune 500 companies. Working with over 100 top AI teams, Workera has defined the AI and data project development lifecycle, as well as the roles, the tasks, and the required skills to execute each phase of a data and AI project. Now, to illustrate our approach, let's take machine learning. Today, many HR tech solutions view machine learning as a skill, and identifying the skill in employees is done largely in one of two ways. It's either self-reported by the employee 
or it's scraped from a CV or inferred based on activities such as taking a course. In contrast, Workera views machine learning not as a skill, but as a domain. And under that domain, there are subdomains and topics and subtopics, and then finally skills and over 200 discrete skills from, from machine learning, as a matter of fact. And it's at this level that we measure capabilities in an explicit way. Now, this level of precision matters because the skill sets are different for each employee. Their job titles may be the same, but their capabilities are not. And when it comes to upskilling these employees, this level of precision is critical. A traditional approach is to take the same data analysts that you don't have a skills profile for, and then to send them through the same learning plan. Now, this is going to teach some skills, but not all that's needed, and it's going to take a lot of time. The Workera precision upskilling approach creates a tailored learning plan that targets the specific skills needed for each employee in a fraction of the time. And for your employees, Workera is like getting Stanford level mentorship. And for your organization, Workera delivers the skill signal that powers all parts of your human capital management ecosystem. We've worked with dozens of organizations to date, including global Fortune 500 companies across numerous industries. We'd be honored to have a discussion with your team to see how we can assist with your workforce upskilling strategy. We normally work with CEOs, CIOs, CHROs, business unit leaders, and heads of data and AI academies. And we can be reached at either james at workera.ai or at my co-founder's email address at kian at workera.ai. Thank you. Our next company provides end-to-end -end enterprise software for smarter corporate sustainability management, empowering companies to create value from their ESG strategy, data, and reporting. Welcoming Novisto. Hi there, this is Jasper from Novisto. Since we last spoke, I'm happy to say that we've continued on our high growth trajectory. We grew our team by almost 50%, and we signed with nine new customers with an average market cap of 20 billion US dollars. So our banks and insurance companies and other actually in the tech industry. As a reminder, Novisto's aim is to be the world's leading software solution for integrated ESG data and management. In case you weren't able to attend a selection day in August, let me run you through what Novisto does real quick. We have identified four major and consistent pain points in ESG data management. First, the nature of ESG data makes it extremely difficult to efficiently gather, making companies rely on primitive tools to aggregate data across units. Second, the data of quality, the quality of published ESG data is inconsistent. Third, multiple reporting standards and frameworks makes it difficult to determine what topics to report on, what information to provide, and where to put it. And fourth, companies lack a holistic view of their ESG data that would allow them to clearly assess risks and opportunities. At Novisto, we are building an ERP for ESG, allowing our customers to store key documents, policies, and reports for a more data-centric approach. Novisto automates data collection through an automated solicitation method, the importation of data sets, and APIs that connect to existing softwares in a company's tech stack, increasing efficiency and decreasing human error. We digitize and centralize all relevant standards, frameworks, and rating agencies, and are continuously updating our matrix and adding customer-specific metrics to increase reporting and disclosure efficiency. With our powerful quality assurance features, Novisto's customers can be confident in their data set and our digitally, digitally enabled audit trail allows them to log who uploaded, approved, or modified a specific data point and when, this greatly facilitates their third-party auditing. Our AI algorithms can provide additional insight on sustainability performance, ultimately equipping your company with all the necessary tools to make the best data-driven sustainability decisions. With Novisto, our customers can expect increased trust in their data set, efficiency in their business processes, and insight generation from their ESG data, facilitating, again, data-driven decision-making for to increase their sustainability performance. Novisto is accessible through any browser and by any number of users at the same time. 
Our purpose is to allow our customers to build their ESG data lake through a very flexible metric library. This list of data points is based on standards, but customized to the client's needs and is fully searchable by various categories. During onboarding, our ESG analyst team will collaborate with our customers to establish this list based on the company's ESG strategy. Our Explore module also allows companies to search through their documents and quickly identify relevant paragraphs. Finally, we allow our users to benchmark their sustainability progress against their competitors using publicly available data at very granular levels, down to the individual metric. We have quite the agenda for the next 12 months. We are gearing up for a Series B round of financing. We are looking to double our team. We're establishing a physical presence in Asia. We're progressing at light speed on a product roadmap with additional AI functionalities, which will continue to streamline ESG data management. And until the end of 2021, we're still offering our pre-commercial pricing on our solution. So if you're curious to learn more about our solution and you want to lock in a great pricing for the next few years, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Our next company's platform allows businesses to understand their carbon impact and become carbon neutral by connecting them to market leading carbon projects. Minimum has specifically designed their service to be super accessible to use providing both an API and also a no-code solution. Let's hear more about what they have to say. Hi folks, I'm Freddie, the CEO and one of the co-founders here at Minimum. Minimum is the easiest way for any company to understand, reduce and offset their carbon emissions, ultimately working towards that net zero goal. Because of its ease of use, it's also the perfect tool for financial institutions to hand out to their portfolio of companies um, to collect ESG metrics from them and also help their wider portfolio to work towards that net zero target. Tiny bit of background on, on me first. Um, I started um, a Boston Consulting Group with a, one of my other co-founders, Chris, working with some of the biggest companies in the world. Uh, I then went into venture capital at a fund called Augmentum Fintech, uh, the largest publicly listed fintech focused VC fund um, in Europe. So working with much smaller companies, uh, specifically in the fintech space, one of the things that was really encouraging to see is increasingly companies of all shapes and sizes uh, are trying to understand their footprint and, and work towards net zero. Um, what was uh, very evident, blindingly obvious to see is that no tools have been created to help companies to actually do that, right? You're still reliant on old school consulting services, getting like Ernst & Young or a boutique consultancy in uh, to try and help you understand your footprint. It's slow, it's manual, it's incredibly expensive. Uh, it's effectively not an option for a lot of companies, particularly of smaller sizes. And it also doesn't keep you up to date on your emissions profile. You just get this like one-off report and you have to do it again in about a year's time. Minimum changes all that and it's completely self-serve. So we have a fully flexible calculations engine that allows any company to move through our flow uh, to understand their carbon footprint, taking as much data as you might have. So we can get as precise as if you put in a flight number, we know the origin and destination of that flight. We know the type of plane that's being used. We know the type of fuel that would be used for that plane. We even know how busy that plane is likely to have been based on the timings of the flight. So we can get a very granular view of the emissions of each part of your business. If you only have higher level information, so instead of knowing the exact kilowattage like we have here um, of your building, you might even just put in the number of desks in your office, right? Because you might not know even the floor space. We do a lot of clever work in the back end uh, to start approximating the likely emissions of that office based on the, the likely de density of those desk space um, in the area that you're in and the types of energy being used, uh, again, if it's in sort of East London, for example, to come up with a really quite meaningful view of your footprint. Uh, this is what we get to, again, for any company, we can go really, really detailed. We can going right at the enterprise level um, to make this uh, this tool much more sophisticated. We have different tools for restaurants, hotels, different kinds of industry that hone in on the key areas for that industry. And this is the output, right? You can start to see what your emissions profile looks like. This is totally important. It's essential for, for reaching net zero. You can start to see where the key areas are where you can reduce. We can steer you towards you know, easy wins, for example, moving to a green energy tariff. And you can start to see how you can reduce your emissions um, across your business. Naturally, we're really seeing this to, to great effect with VCs, with PE funds. Um, we're starting to talk to pension groups around distributing this, oh, in fact, insurers also with their carriers, to distribute this to their various partner companies, if you like, often it's in a portfolio. Super simple tool um, for those companies to, to fill out, you know, it could be 15, 20 minutes, and you start to have a really granular view of ESG metrics across your portfolio. So important for reporting, and that's a really important thing that we bring to the table with Minimum. It's providing all this data in easily reportable form. You can naturally start to see that, you know, any um, 
uh, changes that you could make in those companies. You know, if we can make 20% of our portfolio on green energy tariffs, we can start to measure both the cost and the environmental benefit of taking those initiatives. So really helpful planning tool there towards net zero. What we also provide is an ability to um, neutralize any of those emissions that you can't just reduce overnight. And there are plenty of them. Um, you know, even the environmental environmental agency for the government, um, by 2030, they're hoping to reach net zero by reducing about 45% of their emissions and offsetting about 55%. So you need effective offsetting projects. We are very, very focused on this. One of my co-founders, Freddie, uh, I met back in my days at university, did his master's in physics at Oxford, came top of his year specializing in climate science really, really focused on the right portfolio of projects, ranging from cutting edge um, frontier carbon removal projects that are like $1,000 a ton, through to more accessible projects, um, like really effective uh, renewable energy or, or reforestation projects. You need to have a portfolio. We adhere to the Oxford principles of portfolio uh, uh, sort of offsetting in that respect, and you know, would always be happy to talk through all of that in more detail, but a really important element there. Um, the two key areas really of greenwashing risk are not understanding your emissions before you start to reduce it. That's really important. So that's why this is so important and making sure you're picking the right projects and really you need to have a portfolio. So we manage that really carefully for you. Finally, this is the reporting element, really, really important. Um, you know, we're prepared for financial reporting uh, to be caught up with by sustainability reporting. We will give you all the data across your positive impact of the offsetting projects as well as the ESG metrics across your portfolio. Would love to chat through anything in more depth anytime. Thank you very much. Our next and final company uses machine learning and natural language processing to help regulated organizations manage their risk obligations and prevent financial crime. Let's hear from Comply Advantage on how their real-time AML screening and monitoring solution designed to is re designed to reduce false positive alerts on an average between 60 and 80%. Hi, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Thank you very much for attending the plug and play event, as well as taking the opportunity to learn more about Comply Advantage. My name is Brennan Galvan, and I'm an account executive based out of New York City. A little bit about Comply Advantage, founded in 2014, have over 600 customers spanning across 75 different countries. We're getting close to the 300 employee mark, operating in three different continents. We serve typical financial institutions, global broker dealers in both the crypto and equity space, digital banks, neo banks, and traditional financial institutions and fintechs as a whole. Some differentiators about Comply Advantage that we provide to our end clients is the highest level of security and risk mitigation, the least amount of customer friction for their end users, and lowering operational impact across the board. At our core, we are a data company our data generation is through cutting edge technology on the front end, deploying AI machine learning. So our data is never stale. The updates occur in real time. This data consists of global sanction and watch lists, politically exposed persons lists, as well as adverse media negative news. In terms of how we compare to what financial crime has seen in the last two decades or so, we deploy cutting edge technology on the front end, automating the approach to this collection of data, whether that's the structured sanction and watch list or the unstructured data ranging across local adverse media news publications all the way to international news publications. We're cloud-based, so we're software as a service. We provide automated ongoing monitoring on a nightly basis. Additionally, we have the data on the front end but tying in that data on the back end is something called transaction risk management. Our system gives the end user and end clients the ability to monitor a client's entire life cycle when it comes to all things AML. This consists of customer screening and ongoing monitoring during the onboarding process. After that account is opening, say at a typical financial institution, they receive a debit card, um, a retail checking account, maybe the ability to send remittance payments cross border. That's where we can tie in transaction screening. So screening, for example, sender and beneficiary of a remittance payment or monitoring of transactions. So anything indicative of anti-money laundering behaviors that our end clients would like to capture in real time. So that end-to-end -end approach is beneficial for a holistic view. One case study that's fantastic and personally, my favorite is the Santander 
adverse media negative news use case. Reducing onboarding time from 12 to two days is great from an operational standpoint and enhancing and streamlining that customer journey to get access to the financial tools and um, instruments that they need quicker. We saw an 80% reduction in false positive hit rate, which meant that the employees were able to focus on other tasks at hand. The best part is though, back two years ago, Santander actually received, and we were just a piece of this puzzle for them, but a digital innovation award for their innovative approach to digitizing the onboarding process for their end users. Now, the motto for us is compliance does not have to be painful, but the vision and mission is we want to enable safe and sustainable growth for all financial technology companies, for all financial institutions that we partner with. Most recently, we've put money to our mouth in a sense and launched something called Comply Launch. This is able for early stage startups, pre-seed companies, et cetera, to drive growth through some type of incubator program. We would love to hear a bit about your company. If you wanted to learn more about it, please feel free to contact myself. Certainly, we'll be on the lookout for any and all questions as we conclude here, as well as additional emails, or certainly call myself as well. Thank you. Thank you, Comply Advantage. And with that, we'd like to wrap up today's startup presentations. We hope you enjoyed these quick presentations and learned a little bit more about technologies that will be shaping the future of the financial industry. On behalf of myself, Nadine, and the entire FinTech team, I'd like to thank all of our Batch 14 startups for being a part of this program over the last three months. It's been an absolute pleasure working with you, and I really look forward to staying in touch. Now, before I pass it to Nadine, with our corporate, for our Corporate Innovation Award Ceremony, I'd like to also say thank you and give a huge shout out to all the mentors that have helped shape our program. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy lives and for giving invaluable feedback and advice to our startups, hosting workshop, workshops, and speaking at our events. But we really appreciate every one of you. And now to Nadine with the Corporate Innovation Awards. Thank you so much, Robbie. And for this summit's Corporate Innovation Awards, we are happy to announce our FinTech winners, M&T Bank and Fujisoft. So we have been choosing these corporate partners based on their commitment to uh, cultivate external relationships, not only with startups, but also with other corporate partners, as well as thought leaders in our ecosystem and network to encourage innovation. For m and Bank specifically, since joining in 2019, m and has been running several POCs, pilots, and rollouts with several companies in our network. And earlier this year, Tom and his team announced a great partnership with one of the batch companies called Rails to solve pain points for small businesses. In addition to that, m and works hand-in-hand -hand with Plug and Play with our ventures team to source great startups for their investment opportunities. So with that being said, please help me to welcome our champion, Tom Kingsley, who is the Vice President of m and Venture Group. Thank you, Nadine, and thank you to the Plug and Play team for this award. For those that don't know me, I am Tom Kingsley. I am the Director of Enterprise Innovation here at m and Bank. We've been partners with Plug and Play for the past three years, and every year it keeps getting deeper and more meaningful on how we engage Plug and Play and how we engage the fintech ecosystem that's provided to us. Plug and Play provides us early access to innovators, to new companies, and to people at the heart of really trying to change financial services. At m and our deepest mission is to provide a difference in people's lives. The teams that I work on are focused on trying to drive meaningful partnerships that unlock great ideas that can really empower our customers' financial journeys. We couldn't do this without partners like Plug and Play, and we are very appreciative of this award. We're very appreciative to be a part of this ecosystem, and we look forward to continued success. Thank you to the Plug and Play team, and thank you to Nadine. Now back to you, Nadine. Thank you so much, Tom. And the second innovation award for 2021 goes to Fujisoft. So Fujisoft has been a partner with Plug and Play for about three years now. And Mark Kazu and their entire team are, op are utilizing our open innovation platform to identify current trends as well as startup solutions in the space. In addition to that, Fujisoft has dedicated time to help our startups participating in co by participating in corporate reverse pitch sessions as well as office hours. So to our Fujisoft team, 
We are very impressed with your ability to identify new ideas, to transform them into products and services and processes that benefit your firm as well as your customers. So thank you for choosing us as your partner and we enjoy working with you very, very much. With that, over to Mark. Hello, everybody, and thank you, Nadine, for presenting this award to me today. Um, I'd very much like to thank Plug and Play, as well as the rest of Fujisoft and, of course, Fujisoft America, who helped us along our way in, in this uh, endeavor. Um, so, first of all, um, for Fujisoft, Plug and Play has been a massive help in increasing our activities in Silicon Valley. We've been introduced to dozens of startups, and we've been able to research hundreds more. Um, so thank you all for the startups that have been in contact with us and helped us get on our way. Um, so for now, um, we're still sort of stuck in Japan a little bit, but uh, thanks to our efforts in Fuji South America, we've been able to, to keep our presence in, in America quite strong. Um, we're looking forward to seeing you again in person. I'm currently still in Japan, but I, I will be visiting Silicon Valley once things cool down a little bit. Um, and yeah, I, I'm just very grateful for this award. Um, in the next you know, year and a half or so, we'll be able to, to get back to, to America, hopefully, and be able to, to do more, more, more details, more, more in-depth studies, we'll start up some more work with them. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to, to, to continue working with Plug and Play them for the, the year ahead. And uh, I look forward to working with new startups that come through the ecosystem. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mark. And with that, we conclude our Corporate Innovation Award winner ceremony. The world is opening up and it's becoming clear 2022 will be another incredible year for fintech and we are very much looking forward to seeing many of our partners here at our headquarter in Sunnyvale, but also in other cities across the country. So on this slide, we listed a few major industry events for next year that we are planning to attend. If you are also planning to be there, please use the poll to let us know and we would love to catch up with you as well as your teams while you are in these towns. We are also very excited to support one of our most favorite networking, virtual networking events of 2021, FinTech Meetup. Yes, that's right. This event is all about meetings. No content, no keynotes, just meetings. So we decided to partner up with FinTech Meetup again for 2022 to bring our communities together. And then last but not least, I would like to share a few important plug and play program updates. On December 9th, we'll be hosting our Anchor Partner Roundtable. So our keynote speaker for this event will be Arnold Anker, who is, leads the BNP Paribas Innovation Lab in San Francisco. And he will talk about uh, the trends and sustainability as they relate to the financial service industry. And together with our ventures team, we'll our ventures team will share some of the startups that they have been most excited about over the course of the last few months. So if you're an anchor partner, please make sure to sign up and your um, partner success manager will also share a calendar invite and a dedicated invitation with you very shortly. And then we'll share the top 100 list with our Eco Plus as well as our anchor partners on December 16 and kick off our next batch in February. So thank you very much for attending today's fintech event for everyone that is here with us in person today please join us for lunch on the patio as well as for the summer summit celebration at 2 p.m at the fortland brewing company in sunnyvale again thank you all and we hope to see you soon thank you